Measure of words. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you don't see somebody that is scared but of... But it will show you everything before and if you want something yeah, to cut, you uh, can cut. So that's how we behave. <laughs> Properly. <laughs> Uh, kind of. But you can also do a performance if mm, you want to. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, mo uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, I'm saying good evening also because we have some guests uh, tonight with us, apart from the students from the School for Curatorial Studies uh, Venice. Uh, but uh, we wanted to invite also some guests because we would really be happy to participate to this conversation uh, with Pedro Barbosa from Brazil. Pedro Barbosa, even though most of the students already know almost everything about you, but uh, I still want to make us an introduction. He lives in Sao Paulo and with uh, his wife Patricia, you, you say the surname? I'm Moraes. Moraes and uh, their son, uh, he started his collection in 1999. My daughter. Son and daughter. Son and daughter, yeah. He started his collection uh, in 1999 and um, he became uh, interested in the materiality of uh, 1970s abstract sculpture and began buying work from the mid 90s, is that right? No, actually, in the 60s to 70s, mm -hmm. and then later the 2000s. So, um, the interesting thing about Pedro, and also the reason why we have invited him, is that uh, he's not only a collector, but he's also uh, doing interesting projects. Uh, he has a residency for artists, uh, and for curators, and also for art critics, uh, that uh, he's hosting as long as he has also an interesting archive of material related to the 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah. And uh, so it's something that uh, uh, is attracting a lot of people that are studying those periods because are able to find materials that not, it's not so easy to find, especially also related to uh, Brazilian art. Uh, and at the same time, he's uh, uh, supporting certain institutions with exhibition and all over the world. Um, I'm not going to count all of them because uh, it would be yeah, too many. Are, there are a few. Yes. So um, he's uh, doing a sort of work that uh, uh, it's extremely interesting for the research that our students from the previous curatorial course during the winter time have uh, been doing about uh, illuminating the uh, collectors that are uh, interested in uh, sort of making researches in the contemporaneity by supporting artists that could be in the future, you know, the one who are going to be, you know, uh, interesting artists that uh, might uh, have something to say to the art scene. And uh, so this project was more contemporary than contemporary with this idea. We started to have these dialogues and thanks to the support uh, of the Hotel Greedy Luxury Collection and the Hotel Daniele Luxury Collection, we are in this uh, fantastic frame and uh, I would uh, really love to start uh, this conversation and I would be really happy if all of you are going to participate to this conversation. And uh, I would like uh, to ask Sandro to start with some questions uh, but, uh, after my presentation. Yes, it's not the first time that we are talking because it's a workshop together with our students, so we already did a lot of questions. We already started the dialogue with Pedro. And uh, yes, I can maybe start with a question from Walter Benjamin, if you don't uh, mind. So we already know each other some days, so I was, uh, we were talking to each other, and I recognized that uh, I liked very much when you were talking about your home and how you made the display of your works. And there is this part uh, where he says, I want to create sense, I want to 
not only collect objects, but the most important thing is how the objects relate to each other. And you have this square where you put all the works from uh, the native, from the native inhabitants from uh, North America and uh, South America, and you dedicate them just a square. But you said once they had all the country, and now they, the, so at the same time, they had all the country in the past, and now they don't have it anymore. So then you go up the stairs, and you see uh, an artwork from the Christ, you said. So it's like a personal, you said, redemption when you see it. So all, every object you have in your collection have, uh, have a relationship to each other. And that's exactly a little bit like uh, Benjamin says. So it's like creating a kind of history of the collector. So it's like your own, you're creating a kind of new kind of history meaning. And also with this very impressive th uh, object, but this somehow the history of Brazil. Could that be also your case, that you're trying to give some um, histories, a new historical set with, that, with your collection? that relates to yeah. you as a person, but also the history of your country. Yeah, more important than the country itself, uh, it talks about myself. It uh, reflects the way I, I think and I see things. Uh, all this display and the artworks themselves, they have a... a I most of them have a very strong message. And I'm kind of a very opinionated uh, person. So they match with my, my personality. So I guess, you know, I can say, yes, uh, it does have to be with myself, with my inner self, the way, the way I think. It's, it has been always, very well planned and, and, and thought how uh, I would uh, build this thing. And actually all the changes that uh, the collection had over these years are actually you know, well thought beforehand. Uh, and we prepare and then we move. So yes, I, I guess you, you make a very certain uh, assessment. And, and y the core pieces are conceptual art of your whole collection and also when you are sometimes you're also collecting now contemporary art, it's very con conceptual, very rational art. Would you, would you agree or? Uh, so it's thoughtful, mm, it's for think it's... Honestly, I don't think it's that rational. Uh, I think there are a lot of hidden messages in, in all the works. Uh, you know, I try not to think rationally. You know, and it looks like that uh, everything is well put together, but there is a maze in my head that uh, actually drives me somewhere. Okay, it, it's complicated. I, I'm deeply involved in in uh, psychoanalysis, so this the collection itself is uh, very. We we talk a lot about how things are going. So you know, I don't know how I can, uh, but my unconscious uh, is very involved in, in this thing. Um, just from what you've been talking about your own collection um, and how it's developed, it, it seems like the collection kind of develops as you grow as well. It started in Brazil, um, and at some point you expanded to the, the wider world, um, and then it honed in on conceptual art specifically. Um, do you have like a, a next step that you're going towards in your collection yeah, yeah, yeah. or how it's developing? A at this moment, you know, something that we didn't talk in the morning. I'm looking 
uh, very close to any kind of performing arts, um, mostly dance. Okay. So uh, this is something that you know. There's a lot of material in the, in the in regarding to archives. Of course, actually, we don't have the dance, right? So you can find, you know, it's you can find everywhere actually. Uh, particularly in Italy, just to make a point, you know, in the late '60s and to mid '70s. We can talk at all these events that uh, happen at the Latico, where all these main American dancers, like Trisha Brown, Von Rainer, Laura Dean, Paxton, uh, Paxton uh, and the musicians, right? Like Stevie Wright, Philip Glass, uh, Cage. Cage. Yeah, they were all here, okay? performing every single year uh, at the Latico. So there is uh, quite a bit of material here, uh, actually. And more interesting is, is that I don't see this group together anywhere else. Uh, they only really got together as a major group here in Italy every year at the Latico. It uh, was a gallery uh, in Rome that was very cutting edge at the point. Don't you think to uh, make uh, some exception and why not in a Brazilian young artist? I buy a lot of Brazilian yeah. young artists. No, I mean to buy some um, Italian or Ukrainian young conceptual <laughs> I have a lot of Italian conceptual <laughs> arts. <laughs> yes. yeah. Oh yeah, Italy is a pretty fertile country in this subject. Yeah. Do you have any uh, decorative piece of art which you no. consider as a... You no. don't consider it as an art at all? I think you don't like it, right? You I don't like be beauty as some kind that... Yeah, beauty is part of the thing. I'm way more concerned with the content. Yes. Don't you think that one uh, decorative piece of art can, be, can have a context? Listen, uh, according to your idea? Everyone, everything can have a, a, a content, but I don't like the visual excitement. You don't like the aesthetic? Yeah. If I look to that thing, it's very colorful, you know, it's something that doesn't please me. Okay. It may please other people, so, you know, it, it's only my thing, you know. It's not right or wrong, okay, it's my thing. I'm not, I'm not judging anything. You know, it may be good, may be bad, may have content. I, okay. it's not my cup of tea. Don't you have any mosaic? Yes, Mosaic? I have. You do have? Yes, one. But it's, um, the mosaic has quite a bit of uh, a story behind this by a uh, Cypriot artist called Christodoulos Panayotti. And the stones were removed from Syria. And they were assembled as a mosaic in Cyprus. Actually, they the small stones. You know, that's Cyprus and that part of uh, Europe, including here. You got a lot, a lot of references. Now, in these times, it was removed from Syria or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to know um, your opinion on Latin American art within the art world, because sometimes we as Latin Americans perceive that our art is not as well known, as good for the market. Uh, I keep on hearing those kind of comments, and I would like you to tell me uh, what's your opinion on Latin American art globally? Do you think that people notice? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, regarding the market, again, you know, not talking I really about don't care the market, for the market, but, because, uh, um, yeah. no. uh, but yes, if you if you look, for instance, uh, Mario Garcia Torres will have a solo show at the Walker. Uh, you know, you, all these names, you know, like Maki has been, you know, it's been shown 
all over. It's an Argentinian uh, in the collection, or a Colombian called Nicolas Paris had a solo show in, uh, in Portugal two years ago. It's in the collections of the main uh, museums. MoMA has, for instance, a big chunk of his multiples. Uh, Jonatas de Andrade, he very much uh, stays outside Brazil. Uh, he's represented by Italian Gallery Continua, the way. Uh, uh, who else? You have uh, Eugenio Dipor in, Ch in Chile. You have Alfredo Jar in Chile. Uh, in Peru, there are a few guys like uh, Martinat, uh, Sandra Gamarra. Uh, in Colombia, we have, we have Mateo Lopez. Uh, so, these are in Ecuador. You have a few guys also like Adrian Balseca, that uh, unfortunately he's, he had a very serious surgery. He's, he's suffering big time. Hope he, he covers. Uh, so, you know, you have all over. So you have a lot of uh, Venezuelans that are unfortunately outside of Venezuela, like Alessandro Balto Yazbek that lives in Berlin. Uh, and these guys are everywhere. Okay, Amaria Pica, for instance, mm -hmm. an Argentinian. Uh, so, you know, now we are well represented and, and people are looking at them. I don't think that, uh, of course, market-wise, okay, no, but institutional-wise, uh, group shows, uh, yes, they are present. Can be more, but they are present. No, I don't do any exhibition. Do. No, no, no. So, uh, someone else uh, organize. I don't do anything. But your curator? Uh, with the works, not really. So you you know? don't have enough works of uh, one artist to make an exhibition? Personal exhibition? A single? Uh, yeah, an a single. single. No, it's not. Uh, I think that this, this thing of accumulation of uh, one artist is, is something that is uh, no maybe good. Maybe not. Okay, the for instance, we, we Why is that not good? Because I think that they, it has to be spread over to m many uh, collectors and institutions. Uh, this, is, this is how I feel. It's, I rarely have an artist that I have more than six to eight pieces. So it's not that you have a tendency to follow their career or their development? I follow their career. Sure, you follow it, but not but in terms of continuing But uh, there is one pieces. time that I, I let it go. Yeah. No, we can have. Uh, we have a thousand pieces, so uh, we can make. Uh, <laughs> so with a thousand pieces, you know. Because it's good for the career of the artist. Yeah, but uh, uh, you know, I'm not uh, an institution, right? So we lend works. We don't. We don't prepare shows. We don't draw shows. How do you find new artists? Huh, this is a very interesting <laughs> question. We wanted to ask you the whole morning. <laughs> I don't How know. do you find new artists? <laughs> uh, I find a lot through dealers. Mm. Uh, I have very solid relationship with a group of dealers. Uh, I would say that Outside Brazil, I think that Silvia Covalho from Rodeo Gallery is the most important dealer in the last six years for us. How do you choose dealers? <laughs> yeah, it's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it's lucky, no? It's, uh, 
you know, you build a relationship, you know, over a certain amount of time and, and either you become close because the person trusts you and you trust the person or, you know, it uh, fades away the, the, the relationship. And then once it, it fades away, it's never the, the same thing. You know, so I, I try to really go beyond my means to really build the relationship. But of course, you know, there are times that it doesn't work. It's like uh, any kind of relationship. Yeah, sure. you know. But apart from that gallery, you probably have oh, other yeah. dealers. So I would say own. that they're here in Italy. Uh, Italy is a fascinating country, and it's not because I'm here, but these guys were born with art, so they they really talk very well. They are they're what I call car dealers. That I, I always say this word. Uh, you know, you can you can talk, uh, for example, uh, with Gianji from uh, Maria Fonti, and the guy gives you a lecture. You know, so once you have a relationship with someone that gives you a lot, you know, uh, there's no way that you are not gonna do business with this person, you know. He's uh, very generous in, in, uh, in, in, in teaching me, you know, and, uh, and providing me information. So, uh, you have to either uh, buy, support his artists, introduce people, uh, introduce to curators, artists that uh, he's starting. So, there are a bunch of things that you can help that are not only in, uh, in, in uh, that mean they're not they they don't mean buying. Okay, you can do many many other things. For instance, saying his name, Fonti Gianji. Okay, then you have Nicolò Sprovieri. Uh, you have Continua very good friends with Maurizio. Uh, and here you have uh, Massimo Vini, that is, for me, uh, one of the most uh, interesting dealers I ever met. Uh, Rafaela Portesi, also amazing person, you know. Uh, for me, he really can talk, so there are is, uh, here there is a large number that, uh, for instance, in France, I have one dealer. So here I talk to seven or eight in France, I talk to one. Okay, like in Spain, I talk uh, very often to, let's say, four dealers. In Portugal, three. In Germany, three. And people say, well, Germany is such, a, is such a big market, right? There are many, many galleries, so it's gigantic. Go to Berlin, there is a gallery in every single door. Uh, but you know, for instance, I talk to three, four, uh, not more than this. In Italy, again, like seven, eight. New York, there are four or five. Uh, in the UK, in London, there are like four also. So, uh, <coughs> no, there is not a, lar a large number. Uh, the other thing that a lot of artists are represented by many galleries, so, you know, I, it might be represented by one gallery, but, you know, I have relationship with the others, so I go to the other. Uh, and and ask for for the thing. I forgot uh, to mention Franco Noero. Mm. Sorry, Franco Noero. <laughs> he, we have been uh, with him for quite a long time. But you mainly mention actually very established galleries. No, Gianji at Fonti is but not. A Rodeo Gallery, not that many people know. Essex Street in, in New York, Bridget Donahue in New York, you know, 
they're like tiny galleries. Like Bridget Donahue, uh, less than two years ago, had four artists in her program. She had just started. So when I started, well, dealing with Sylvia Kovali, she was, she still had her gallery in Istanbul. You know, she wasn't that, that a big thing. You know, the, the big galleries we deal is Franco, Continua, uh, Menini. Menini, Andres Fersendler, uh, Neugert Schneider, uh, 303, uh, uh, that it comes to my mind, uh, it's, uh, it's this, these names, but um, most of them are medium size, but some of them actually are, are growing, they have, the tickets have multiplied, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. So uh, now you have to really pick your uh, your horses. Do you pay them visits or do you browse catalogs virtually before buying No, they research pieces? from the artists, you know. When, uh, when it's young, we, we ask the dealer to provide all the information uh, they have. Uh, so, and then we try to, to talk. So, uh, even like uh, older artists, for instance, there is this American lady called Lorraine O'Grady. Uh, she has been around for decades. Uh, she is a professor uh, in the US. She's retired. And we were researching her work because many years ago we saw her work at Kunsthal Basel, from maybe like 2011, 10. Uh, and then I, it happens that, you know, we later found out that Nick Pauls, who is a, also a key artist for us, had written the, the text for uh, Lorraine at Kunsthal Basel. Uh, so we were already following her, uh, Nick, that was in the collection in, uh, in, and is close to us, uh, had written things about they, I found out they, they are good friends too, and I said, well, everything is connecting, right? And then she was, she gave a lecture in Harvard, and I took the plane, I flew to Harvard, you know? Uh, and then I introduced myself to her. And that's it, you had to actually to move yourself you know, <laughs> towards them. And then, and then it's really crazy, then um, when uh, during Nick's opening at the Whitney, and there she was, you know, so saw each other again, we exchanged emails from time to time. Uh, and that's it, that's, uh, their relationship flows. And how much of your time does it take to follow artists? I mean, it, it seems that you are uh, around this uh, art uh, all day long. I all mean, day long. All day long. <laughs> so you take calls, you do Skype calls, meetings. All day long. It's 24 by 7. Actually, I would say that it's 48 by 7 because <laughs> it's myself in Yaku. Yeah. Right, that's so, why. Yeah, the flow of information that we have is, is gigantic. Mm. Because we, we get, we are flooded with uh, emails, magazines, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, the, it comes out an article from an artist in a magazine, I don't know where, okay, this article will be there in our hands in a week or so. Mm -hmm. so, so it's uh, it, it's busy. In an interview at the Delphina Foundation, you insisted of the emotional part of choosing an artist, so it's quite paradoxical with the intuitual procedure. Yeah, so because we try to know them. Yeah. So it ends up that we develop a relationship, so it's emotional. Can I have a very general question? Uh, what was the first step, first intention to plunge into art sphere um, for you? Well, the first intention was actually to save money. <laughs> was the other way around of what we see today. As I said, I can 
you know, contradict myself in a second. No, I, I changed my opinion. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so don't ever agree with me. I may, you know, change my opinion <laughs> quite fast. And with your residency program and this um, push to engage um, more socially or to really promote um, artist practices, ha have you ever commissioned artists to do a piece for a certain... Sh is that something no, no, that no. you would... No? no, I don't do that. Yeah. It, it's actually more, more social, honestly. But if it was... People a, to if, hang if out if with artists, so to know yeah. each other. Yeah. It's... Uh, so they go there to mm. to do nothing, just to mm. to understand what goes on mm. and talk to people, engage with uh, with artists, dealers, you know, curators, critics, uh, and you know whatever they want to do. Uh, as I said, I don't care. The only restriction is that you cannot smoke in the building. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned. Oh, sorry. Um, today and yesterday, I think, um, thing about killing a collection. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. What do you mean by that? Yeah, we want to know yeah, about yeah, that. <laughs> uh, I first uh, got uh, in touch with this concept. In uh, there is this this collector in Istanbul called Haru Kumbursian, and he has a space called Collector Space which is very much, uh, probably was a store that, that uh, his family had, you know, that uh, has like a, like a street store. And it's no longer a store, so it's uh, like a 50 square meter space and with a window to, it's very close to Taksim Square. You know, you walk like, two minutes away from Taksim Square in Istanbul, uh, it's his space. So very much when you walk, uh, just in front of the, of the space you see, there is only one artwork uh, uh, each time he shows, because the space is small. Um, but uh, one thing that he makes, he makes kind of an uh, interview with people. And he made an interview with a dear friend called Cesar Cervantes, uh, he's a Mexican collector. And by several reasons, one day uh, Cesar gives me a call and say, listen, I'm selling out the entire collection. You know, I, I chose like eight people that are, that are good friends and I, you can choose you know, and everything's for sale. And then, of course, these eight people bought a big chunk of, of the collection, and some works were uh, people didn't buy, and uh, people came back and later bought, and very much he sold everything. And he bought a Bahagans uh, house, and he lives there. So it's finished. And I tell that uh, he killed, in my point of view, because he made a fire sale. From one day to the other, he sends a PDF of 600 artworks and say everything's for sale. So it was a uh, very intentional thing that he made. Uh, on the other hand, I think that the collection dies when, uh, you know, for instance, it. Uh, well, for instance, buying art is not a challenge anymore. And I have to say that I'm going towards this, you know, and I'm way more interested in, in archive, in archival material uh, already. And uh, so you were talking about your, re your relationship with the artists, with the galleries, the art dealers, and alongside with them you're uh, pointing at some kind of art uh, little by little you came to conceptual art but every time you're pointing to the kind of art that talks to you of right? course, yeah. um, but at the same time you say that you 
you don't want to make art history, you don't want to open a museum, but uh, in some way you're making art history by pointing those artists and by having this kind of talking and you know. Uh, so I don't know what's your relationship with what will remain. Uh, I don't know after your you 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 kill your collection or it dies or I don't know like. Uh, and why don't you are keen on open a space? I don't have money to open a space. <laughs> so, and again, I, this is something that has been stressed big time. I think it's a narcissistic thing. So. Well, it can be seen also like as a way at of this moment, I can change my mm -hmm. opinion. <laughs> it's not nar it can be not narcissistic. Like I can, can change my opinion. At this very this moment, you know, this is the way I think. So you don't have it's a classical problem, yeah. what will be with my collection after, after me? You, you're, no. not, you're not asking this at all. Yeah. Like a Guggenheim question. No, <laughs> I, I don't know when I'm going to die. Maybe 120 years, so I have uh, quite a bit of time still <laughs> in my hand, so. What would be your advice for young collectors of around 30 that they have, they're just starting in life with the work and they would like to collect, but sometimes they have money issues, but they, they their multiples. desire is strong, so what multiples. would you say to them? Unique works and multiple works, they have no difference whatsoever, as long as they are good. <laughs> 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 I actually, uh, uh, at this moment, I think that you can go back in time and buy uh, drawings from the 1600s and 1700s very cheap. No, it's not my cup of tea because most of them are very uh, figurative, landscapes and these things, but I don't like that, okay? It's not that I don't like, you know, I don't like to live with that thing. Uh, so there is an amazing opportunity for people to start collecting this and you know multiples you have artists with multiples uh, every day so and you can build an incredible collection of multiples you can buy great multiples from Bruno Monari, for instance, just uh, talking about Italy, and, uh, and many others. Did you start the archives with the collection, or no. the archives came later? Came way, way, <coughs> way later. Why? Uh, it, it's a very <laughs> funny story. You know, everything started with Stanley Brown. Uh, with our Stanley Brown artist books. But my daughter had two rabbits and they were making a lot of mess at home and they beat and destroyed two of my Stanley Brown <laughs> art books. Okay. So then I went to the web and I bought them back, but also I found out that Stanley Brown had, let's say, 20 more artist books. I said, okay, this Dan Rabbit, you know, he started another mania. <laughs> and then from artist books in conceptual art, I went to magazines, to periodicals, to invitations, to everything. You know, you, you know we have a we know it, each other uh, so and then became a mania and I honestly I think it's it's fascinating because I'm the only one that has this kind of material in Brazil so if you want to research Stanley Brown you know you have to come to me if you want to research Seth Sealog you have to come to me you know and very much everything that is conceptual so when people are, you know, uh, writing dissertations in, in conceptual art and, and everything, and they have to 
They come to me to research. Yes, and, and but the it's not very open. usual that you have that. I mean, there are people that just collect ephemera, people that just collect other books, yeah. people that just collect works. Yeah, but, but I focus in, in particular mm -hmm. artists. So, again, I was I talk, I, I'm going to talk about Stanley Brown again. So, you know, I have like uh, cutouts from newspapers, invitations, articles in magazines. Still today, if something comes out about Stanley Brown, I'll make sure that I that I'm gonna get. By the way, there is a you can you can check in Freeze magazine. There is a pretty interesting article that came out a few years ago uh, about Stanley Brown. Uh, so many invitations. You can have an amazing exhibition of Stanley Brown only with invitations. <laughs> At uh, there is a, a city uh, south of. Uh, Holland, that there is another Stedelijk Museum, I forgot the name of the city, mm -hmm. but they had a great Stanley Brown show, all ephemera, um, was the end of last year. Yes, museum was also starting to understand. The museums museum are going crazy now with this, they are really <coughs> behind the curve, and, uh, and collectors forget it, you know, either there are a few guys that were, that already have everything, and uh, but prices are going through the roof. It's, it's really crazy. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this also put a cap in the market, right? Yeah, sure. When he, when he start competing to uh, to the unique artwork, you know, people will go to the unique artwork because it makes no no sense, also, uh, uh, to buy an old unique artwork and to buy an invitation. <laughs> so. No, yes, no. but unique artworks you have a lot. Invitation, perhaps there are just five, so they are like stamps collection. I mean, there are five yes. co five collectors yes. that want the same stamp. Yes. And when one yes. is in the market, they just try to buy yeah. this stamp. So yeah, there are particular that makes the price. invitations that uh, you yeah. you don't you really don't don't find. It. So. Uh, in this point of view, would be more expensive, but it cannot be more expensive. An invitation of Stanley Brown cannot be more e expensive than uh, a this way Brown, let's say. Uh, it's more his more like, most iconic work. You said that you started. You decided to become a bond trader. Under the dictatorship, what is it? No, no, no. Was it was it in the dictatorship of <laughs> Brazil? No, I, I graduated but, no. in 1984, uh, 1988. Sorry, start engineering what, uh, in 1984. And what uh, what surprised me so what what I really what I really what I remember from our discussions is that you from the beginning said that was I made this conscious de decision to become an uh, to become a bond trader. But you never, uh, you, from, the, from the scratch, you were involved with culture, with collecting. I know that your parents... I, I start later. But uh -huh. your parents were both uh, teachers. Yeah. And you, you didn't see it as an as a, as a, uh, out-out. So I said, I, you said, I become a, a, a trader, you know, in this situation, dictatorship in Brazil, the situation is like this, but you... O never, you always had a, a link, a contact to art and, 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 to, and to culture. I was curious, let's put it this way. Okay. So, uh, but I was not that engaged. I, I always like to read about politics. So politics comes uh, way before. Uh, but uh, art comes when I start making money, you know. So then I, I had the two to buy. Without having money, you cannot buy. So it's you as began as that. in 1999? Yeah, I bought the first uh, work eight, 1998, early 1999. That was a Jesus Soto. It's a Venezuelan kinetic art. You still have it? Yeah. No. Please, I'm not going to sell this. I will, I will keep it. Uh, I 
I guess I sold now, up to now, 25 works. Why? Because they don't make uh, sense in the collection anymore. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you, we have about 1,000, so it's nothing, zero two percent. And was that you wanting to sell the works or people approaching you for them? No. Uh, actually, there is a couple of works that you know people approach. Mm -hmm. They offer me a nice sum of money, mm -hmm. and but I was willing to to sell. It would make no difference. And they are gone, and I'm very happy they are gone because I could buy other things. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a couple of them that it's a series of works, you know. So then someone crazy knew that I had and paid, you know, ridiculous money, and then I bought back another from the same series, cheaper. Uh, I'm a trader, so you know, I, this is something that is not. Uh, but I, I rarely sell. This morning, when we, you were talking about your collection, you also said that, that one branch of your collection is uh, very much devoted to artists that are sort of politically engaged uh, and from certain regions uh, of uh, our globe that are in kind of, uh, you know, particular situation. Um, don't you think that uh, Rather than, and it relates to another idea of uh, engagement of a collector in contemporary art, don't you think that sometimes uh, it's much better to support uh, more relational moments rather than, you know, having real objects, like, you know, the idea of residencies, uh, having people coming to you and talking to you, because they are a lot of artists and groups of artists who are really socially engaged, who are doing projects rather than producing objects. Uh, and so maybe when you say like killing the collection, you know, not in the sense of getting rid of the collection, but somehow change also your approach uh, to the type of works uh, that you might uh, start uh, mm -hmm. rather than buying physically but supporting. Yeah, no, we actually had a project that we tried last year. It's uh, one of the poorest regions in Brazil, uh, but they have a pretty fertile uh, dance tradition. And, and in, you know, knife painting, uh, we sponsor uh, a trip, a research trip of a Brazilian artist and a, and a Portuguese curator, friends of ours, and they went there like for two weeks. They research, they uh, create a plan, they, so they knew what uh, they would uh, um, do. The idea was to to engage with a couple of schools for seminars and workshops. This would be like a two-year program where people would go there to this, this very poor region and stay there uh, from two months to six months, depending on uh, and, uh, the time availability of, uh, of them. And, but we had someone that you really have to to agree because this person would give all the logistics in, in the region. And at the end, we were not able to, to cut the deal because we wanted to, to be totally free in, order, in, in regards to content and to the uh, educational uh, part that we would bring to the schools and you know and people had a, a bit of, a, of a, you know, concerns about 
uh, how far we could go, you know. So we said, no, we do not accept any kind of restrictions in terms of uh, uh, where we can uh, go, where we can go. This total freedom or nothing. Mm -hmm. you know? And they said, oh, so we cannot convict you. I said, fair enough. Yeah. You didn't even stop. Yeah, you didn't go anywhere. But uh, you know, I think that art cannot have any kind of restriction. Actually, you know, there is this phrase that uh, I mentioned to you that I learned from John Fernandez, the curator of Hina Sofia. He said, "Art, art does not have to have good intentions." <laughs> so. Even if it has a bad intention, it's art and it has to be shown. You said earlier that um, your next approach is dance, dancing. So uh, I was wondering whether you're focusing on performance or you're supporting a group of artists that perform. Well, we are involved with, uh, with a couple of people in Brazil. Yes, we are. Uh, but uh, again, we want to bring people from outside and send Brazilians outside. So uh, we have Trajal uh, going to Sao Paulo uh, twice. First was like a field trip to map the scene. And then he came back. He performed seven times in a week. Uh, he's planning to come back this year, at the end of the year, but, uh, uh, and also, uh, I have a, a plan of uh, bringing one of people from uh, Anna Halpring's uh, workshop uh, group in, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar to her, but, you know, I, I, from at least from my end, she's the one that revolution uh, that made a big revolution in dance in the U.S. in the mid '50s, and everyone uh, participated. All these big dancers, uh, you know, were present in her uh, workshops. Uh, Von Rainer, Trisha Brown, Laura Dean, even Martha Graham was there. So you know, all of them. Uh, Simon Forty. Actually, talking like uh, so, everyone was there, and then they developed. They went their own path. So Anna Halpern is key, and I myself went to a seminar there, a dance seminar there. She's ninety-six years old. She lives in the woods in uh, in San Francisco, outside of San Francisco. She still teaches the seminar. Actually, she supervises because she's old, but uh, she's like a chief, you know, saying, oh, do this, do that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, everyone can go. Is there any more question? Also, not from my students, but also from the other guests that were invited tonight. Uh, you are free to talk or if you want to ask something, Pedro. Curiosity. Once you yes. approach an uh, artwork, uh, could be changing. I, I, I understand that. But is it more important how this artwork speaks to you or how the artwork speaks to? No, to me. To you. To me, yeah. Uh, well, the collection is it's my view of expressing myself. Okay, so I can express myself through group of artworks, right? So uh, it has really, I have to be really engaged with, it, with that particular piece. So I know every single piece of the 1,000 works we have. Mm, so no matter if the, the work is, uh, has no relations with the social, political? They are most, most of them. Yes. Most of them are related to this, you know. 
they are in this in a subliminal way mm -hmm. they are some works are definitely works that were to subvert the system you know, works for instance like Sildo Meirelles uh, all these notes that he stamped uh, during the 70s the, or the Coca-Cola bottles that uh, he put labels and then he used to return the Coca-Cola bot bottles go to the to to how to say the bot bottling company that would have filled mm -hmm. it uh, with Coca-Cola again and circulate the thing okay with uh, messages that were uh, not supported by the military regime okay so uh, you know stamping notes about you know people that were murdered you know saying who killed this person and then stamp many notes and these notes were circulating because they were not coming out in newspapers okay mm -hmm. so uh, <laughs> This, like this, this kind of a thing. Bottle in the sea. The same yeah, exactly. Kind of because it get it gets lost, so mm -hmm. you don't know where this this thing goes. Mm -hmm. You know. You are an artist who express yourself through the art. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I could say I'm not an artist, but I use them uh, to uh, <laughs> to speak out. Let's say. You try to make yourself. Yeah, it's uh, you know, instead of uh, writing, you know. I put a group of works together and they <laughs> they have a story to tell. What about archiving your... We, we already spoke about the fact that you are not interested to open up a, a museum or an institution, yeah. but what about a, a newspaper or to tell the story? No, I, I, I support a, a, a bunch of uh, these, these, uh, these people that have zines. You know, I mean, it's just like, like very yeah. interested. Like, they, I think there are many interesting social or political moments like the, the sound piece you showed us today and it would be nice I think to make an access for the public to oh, your to the stories that you all have the in the collection. But all these curators know. You know, they know what they have. Mm. You know, so uh, so then you we, need we the curators out. to make the we, stories from your collection. We, we, we talk, you know. We are always talking. So exchange ideas we we talk about you know what's going on particular shows uh, it's a small group that you know that uh, in this group everyone has uh, connections right. so also you talked about sense in your collection and uh, if this quest of sense has become an obsession for instance. No, the works have to to have some some power relationship. You know? So uh, there is there is a core, right? You know, everything is around this core. Uh, yeah, maybe the yeah, yes, maybe you're right. Could be like this. And have you ever thought of like doing a publication? On the yeah, collection. this could be. This Especially like, since, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, since yeah. you're saying that all the works have a connection, yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe this, that um, would be very like, this interesting. This could be because this friend of mine that uh, who I copied this whole mm. thing, uh, mm -hmm. he, after 10 years, he, he released the publication. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's very useful. Paper because I thought that was more political, it maybe fits it more in line. Yeah, but you know, we, we have already had discussions of having this online. Mm. And these, you know, and people would have access. But one day this will be donated, so it will be in public hands. It's, uh, it's about time that everything will go to public hands. I hope it will go in 70 years. <laughs> I'm 120. <laughs> You have a lot of expectations. I do. <laughs> mm. Any more questions? Don't you interested in this digital content of the artwork? I don't believe in any kind of religion 
spirituality or anything like that. Geometric abstraction? No, it's a lot of <laughs> psychoanalysis. It's a Freud and Lacan uh, inspiration. Something more about the art market, maybe? Tell us something. So well, make, you, make the question. You're, you're quite an expert about that thing. Make questions. Right. You said that you want to subvert the system. You're not a typical collector, but you would like to. No, no, no. I want to the, the things that I'm really engaged And there are a few other people who is is in this thing of uh, code of conduct, uh, uh, conflict of interest. When you have relationship to museums, you are exposed to quite a bit of information. You know, in Wall Street, if you use information for yourself, you, you are arrested. Right? In art, if you use information for yourself, you, you profit. <laughs> So, and it, it's more or less the same thing, you know, because at the very end, you know, art now became an asset class as, you know, having a bunch of shares of uh, XYZ company. So, uh, this is something that is, that has been, uh, has been quite a bit of discussions uh, lately. Something will happen. You know, just bear in mind that every single country is broken, right? Uh, so they're going to have to tax people. It's, it's a no-brainer, all right? Uh, so they're going to tax these things uh, sooner or later. You think works of art? Yeah. And the collections? Yeah. Uh, and the change. And everything. Well, that's very successful for the artists. Oh, but it's good. My, if uh, there is a good usage of the money, okay, it's a way of uh, having a better wealth distribution. But uh, you never know if uh, governments are able to spend the money that's what I'm saying. in a good way. <laughs> Maybe Germany, Sweden. But I'm very sure that in Brazil it's not the way. So you'll get rid of uh, the artworks you donate to a museum. <laughs> okay, and, uh, and that's it. Like a uh, Duvin style, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys know about Duvin? He's dealer. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to read about him. The guy is a genius. Uh, Dutch dealer uh, that uh, Build up the collection of these American tycoons, Vanderbilt, JP Morgan, Rockefeller, and many others. And the most interesting thing, uh, first he was, he had the power of saying, this is a real artwork, it's not fake. So, you know, he could say that this is good or this is no good. Okay, he was such a, uh, you know, seductive guy, you know, in every single sense that he got this power. And the other idea he had was uh, all these American collectors would be taxed at one point. And there were hearings in, in the Congress about tax or not tax and blah, blah, blah. And then Duvin comes with this idea uh, and he brings this idea to the to the tycoons that will be taxing. Listen, guys, in order not to be taxed, you know, let's donate everything <coughs> and start, you know, this thing that if you donate, you are not taxed. So let's build up the National Gallery in Washington. So that's how the National Gallery in Washington starts. Only with donations. By all these tycoons. Mm -hmm. So now there is tax to pay, okay, dum, 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 dum. you give everything away, you're fine. Mm, that's a solution. 
these guys bought everything from all over the planet, right? No, JP Morgan was buying works of uh, seven, eight, ten million dollars. This is in 1900. If you correct this by inflation, you know, we'll go towards 300 million dollars now, but you know, they were Vermeers. So what's the price of a Vermeer today? If he comes to an auction, if uh, you know this uh, modernist or impressionist sells for 300 million, yeah, and no price. Mm -hmm. Just go to the National Gallery in Washington. It's priceless. You're go you're gonna see. It's crazy. Or this other crazy dude in Philadelphia that I don't remember the name. They have a gigantic impressionist collection. And in Washington, it's free for the visitors too. It's free for everyone, mm -hmm. for foreigners. And that just changed that. The, in New York, they just changed yeah. so um, tourists have to pay the full price. Yeah, it exactly. Just yeah, but you buy this this thing that you have access to, you uh, to all museums, yeah. these passes. Um, uh, people that go quite often can buy these memberships and to, to dilute the uh, cost, but, you know. Part of the magic of it. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, this is bad, I, I think. But they are privately, they are like enterprise, right? MoMA just had a, a big, uh, uh, let's say there was the gala and people were protesting uh, last week in front, of the, in front of the museum for better wages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're, they're enterprise. They have all the metrics that uh, that a multinational has. Well, they have. They are separated by departments. You know, they report to a president. Some of them are have a matricial reporting line, like geography and product. Also, there is a specialist in Southeast Asia. And there is and there is a work that is considered that is from painting. So the painting talk to the specialists uh, in the geography, and then they decide. So it's very much like any any multinational. I have a question. So um, about the market actually uh, do, do you think that you for certain artists are able to influence the market because you are I actually know. I think I, I'm you, very engaged with them you know I'm very assertive I, I'm not but saying that you are doing no, it people don't know, you know that, uh, people I, 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 I some people know uh, you know maybe they have a momentum you buy a young contemporary art artist. You are watched by many other collectors. You're watched yeah, by yes, now. because so you are participating to I don't think so. I don't think that I'm that smart. <laughs> you know, yeah, there are a lot of people that have access to the same of information I have. I may be faster in the decision making of buying. That's that's the thing. I, you know, when I when I'm sure it takes me. You know, two or three phone calls with Jacopo and a few pictures and a WhatsApp. So we are very quick. And this uh, is what happened, for instance, with the work that I showed this morning in Park MacArthur. And it has happened also in New York with Martin Sims. Uh, and it almost happened with Sandra Perry in uh, his first show, her first show. Uh, a few months ago, but you know, it, it happened somehow with, with Sandra Perry. But uh, Park MacArthur is an iconic uh, purchase we made because you know, I was in New York. It was like Sunday in New York. The gallery was open. I find out Jacopo in São Paulo. We were talking, exchanging pictures, talking to the dealer. It was the very last day of the exhibition. Everything was available. 
And then, you know, then we cut a very nice deal with the, with, with the dealer. The dealer trusts us. I think, you know, we developed an amazing relationship with him. We, we are good friends. Uh, the other day he, he sent a very young artist from, from Philadelphia, just finished MFA and he pitched the work to us, explain everything. And I said, okay, so let's go for it. You know, so this kind of a uh, relationship, you know, it's helped me help you. And, you know, uh, uh, it's Max O'Graham from Essex Street. Uh, I really like to talk to him. You know, we, we over the years, we, we built uh, this relationship. So uh, if he needs, you know, help in this kind of thing, I was present. You know, I will be present to help him. It's a mutual trust. I'm never gonna let him down because he was really, really nice to me, and I. And this is uh, this will be always remembered. The same thing. Well, actually, uh, I didn't know about that show. Silvia Covari from Rodeo Gallery told me to go there. So you know, she could uh, say, "Well, buy one work of me." You know, and don't buy, you know, she doesn't have to tell me what's going on elsewhere. But Sylvia told me to buy a lot of parties that are now in the collection. And she could keep the secret for her. She didn't have to tell me where this, this thing was. So actually she pitched first the work. No? And she made zero money. But what happens now? Now we are, no, we talk almost in daily basis about everything. So this is what I call a nice, a nice relationship. Maybe I have. Yeah. Can I, I have two, actually two questions. Yes. <laughs> uh, you just mentioned the Bard Foundation in Philadelphia. There is um, the, the, the Bard's band. Exactly, exactly. The Bards, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You didn't mention the name, but you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, yes. I forgot the name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, um, it's really interesting to go to the Bard Foundation and to see how that man lived with this impressionist art <coughs> around him. And it's not the same to go to see a Renoir at the Bart Foundation or to see it in a museum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you, feel, you feel when you go there his exact view of impressionist art. And that gives something more to the pet. So coming back to, to what you do, I don't know your collection, but you expressed very clearly, which was interesting, that it's a way for you to express who you are, the collection. Yes, yes. So maybe it would be interesting for the future, for other to see those artworks in the future as you have seen them. In other words, mm. what is yeah. the, I'm not, I'm I not trying to you convince mean. you to do a museum. Yeah, no, I understand what you mean. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's a good take. I never thought about that. Mm. It's a good take. <laughs> so might be I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. And also you talked about subverting the system. So in any way, it could listen to the uh, iconic uh, thinking of the anarchist, because uh, it's related to I do what I want, I uh, think what I want. So, so for you, what is subverted the system? Just to give some rules, because, so yeah. that's, that's because yeah. the art market, the only market, human trafficking, drug uh, trafficking. Yeah, I always say that. Yeah. <laughs> So and they it's are it's not the regulated without rules. So the, yeah. the anarchic thing would be here, or the subverting the system would be here to introduce at least some, you know, how do you say, rules of conduct, maybe yeah. not laws. But it, I don't know. You know and it's a, respect. A big museum director or a museum director cannot be also the, the, the chief of an art fair, you know, for example, or, or things like this. So just some simple rules of conduct. There are uh, some <laughs> rules that are already on, but you know, there is. We need a lot of improvement, still. 
I'm but not uh, into that. I, I remember when this uh, friend from Portugal, who is a lawyer, he was uh, he gave a talk at Sima in if I'm not wrong, was in Qatar, and then uh, you know before the talk, he came to me and said, uh, "Is there any particular thing that uh, you think it's similar?" Uh, the art market and and what you see around. I said, yes, uh, the art market is very similar, as I said, to drug dealing, weapons uh, trafficking, human bodies, animal people. They are all unregulated and very profitable. But the Somehow, when you when you sell an artist at one price, you just you have that standard, and so the other sale will be um, indexed to that to that standard. It's like the, it's like. Uh, In the secondary market, no one knows what the price. Mm. What was the price that that particular piece traded? Only in in auctions. Mm -hmm. That it's public auction is like a stock exchange is up. You know, in, in some countries are a hundred percent public. In some other countries, you know, there you had uh, the information at that time and you're comp compiling the data, and then you know. Uh, uh, but you know, it's up. Uh, it's public. It should be public mm -hmm. information. It's an auction. In the stock markets is an auction that happens very fast. But so when the galleries sell a piece of art, there's no no, no record? No record. You mm -hmm. don't know. Write invoices. That's what we don't But you don't know. There are it's two people that know the invoice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the one that writes the invoice and the one that pays the invoice. It's not, it's not public. It's not like buying a property in New York. There is registered. Uh, in Brazil, it's becoming public properties and all these things. And the tax man is very active now. But I'm way more concerned about uh, information that you know is exchanged in, in committees. You know, I think that these committees have. Everyone that participates have to have a commitment and not uh, talking anywhere else what uh, was discussed, what is what will be discussed. You know, it's, it's very important information. Uh, there is again, there is a lot of speculation. I'm not saying that uh, museums have uh, the ability to uh, to change prices because museums also pay very bad purchase. Uh, so they they also have a lot of crap in their in their collections. Uh, everyone makes mistakes. But even if it's a mistake, you know, this is uh, sensitive information. And I really think that this has to be kept. You know uh, in among people that uh, that have access, so you know that's why I think it's way more respect than law. It's like classified information. It's just uh, to use a, a word that is that is now used. By the way, there is a Susan Phillips work. Uh, it's beautiful at the Fundacion Prada. That is about a classified uh, file of uh, the these uh, German thinkers uh, that moved to to LA, Adorno and uh, and, and others, right? I mean, Heidegger didn't move to LA. It's yeah. Heidegger, Adorno, and. Uh, Right, there you have a Thomas Mann, you know, that moved there, Schoenberg moved there. No, it's, it's, you know, you're here, you have to go. 
That is a big print. Oh yeah, we are gonna go. Yeah. 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 So if there is no more questions, I would like to thank uh, Pedro, and uh, you can chat with him after this kind of formal conversation. Formal conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, thank you so much, Pedro. It was thank very you. nice to have you with us, with uh, our students from the School for Curatorial Studies here in Venice. And uh, I think uh, you have had quite an interesting moment with you and exchanging ideas and opinions. And in any case, we are going to continue afterwards. So, okay. Indeed. Thank you for the chance. No, thank yeah. you. <laughs>